Hercules was one of the most popular heroes of Greek mythology, the Superman of the ancient world, perhaps most famous for his enormous strength. But there is more to the mythical strongman than just his physical prowess. He was a character of extremes, a symbol of civilization and the very soul of the barbarian, a representation of good and bad magnified to epic proportions. Born in a primitive age, his legend has spanned more than 3,000 years, and it continues to grow. Biography looks at the legend of Hercules. Hercules is the most powerful individual physically on Earth. It's not simply that the figure is an ordinary hero, but that he essentially does everything that a hero can do. He has so many facets. He is a good guy, a strong guy, a bad guy, a guy who had to dress up as a woman, a guy who killed his wife, but loved his wife. He goes to the ends of the earth, he slays monsters that threaten Greek civilization, and he makes the world safe for Greek culture. Classical Greece, a world of magnificent achievements in art, architecture, and literature that have never been surpassed. Now a land of stately ruins that recall the timeless glory that once was. Yet even as Athens stood at its glittering height, the Greeks living in those times had their own ancient ruins to ponder. There were places dating even further back, relics of a mysterious bygone era that evoked awe in the ancients, just as the Parthenon echoes the past today. To the ancient Greeks, it was a world filled with monsters, gods, and heroes and the greatest hero of them all was Hercules. A lot of people think that the name, the Greek name Heracles, goes back to the Bronze Age, to before 1200 BC. That suggests that the stories themselves might go back to the Bronze Age as well. So a lot of this is probably the kind of stuff you would be told on your grandmother's knee. The story of Hercules is the epic saga of the son of Zeus, king of the gods. Condemned by fate to serve a cowardly master, he will be forced to accomplish 12 daunting labors, making him the most renowned hero of all time. He will perform hundreds of noble deeds, from creating the Milky Way to founding the Olympic Games and be elevated to a place among the immortals. Some scholars now believe that Hercules might well have been a person of flesh and blood. I think that there may have been somebody named Hercules who lived during the time the Greeks think of as the time of heroes or may have been a prince named Hercules who accomplished great deeds and a lot of myth became attached to him over the years. My own personal belief is that there probably was a man named Hercules who lived. Hercules is conceived when Zeus descends from his home on Mount Olympus to walk among mortal men. Like all the Greek gods, Zeus has many human weaknesses, including lust, pride, and jealousy. His intervention in human affairs frequently causes more harm than good. 
But now, Zeus plans to perform a deed that will benefit mankind. He intends to father the greatest champion of all time. He chooses a beautiful woman of strong and noble blood who lives in Thebes in central Greece. Zeus comes to her disguised as her husband. Not realizing that Zeus is the father, the boy's mortal parents name him Hercules, which in Greek means glory of Hera. It is a fateful irony, for Hera is queen of the gods, none other than the wife of Zeus himself. Infuriated by her husband's many illicit affairs on Earth, Hera is insanely jealous of all Zeus's mortal children, and most especially of Hercules, the infant boy who has innocently and unknowingly been named after her. She is so enraged and so jealous that she really torments Hercules throughout his life. And she is a very real instigator of many of the evils that befall him. It comes to pass that the child's mortal mother soon learns of Hercules' true identity. Fearing the wrath of Hera, Zeus's jealous wife, the mother leaves Hercules on a barren hillside, exposed to the elements, hoping he will die. But Zeus intervenes, sending one of his daughters, the goddess Athena, to save her infant half-brother. Athena tricks Hera by taking her for a walk near the place where Hercules lies abandoned. There, Hera discovers the child, picks him up, and suckles him as if he is her own. Typically of Hercules, he can't even suckle like a normal baby. He goes way overboard with this and clamps his teeth down on Hera's nipple really hard. So she pulls him off and throws him away across the road, and the milk, we're told, squirts out of her nipple. And this is what makes the Milky Way in the sky, was the milk splashing against the sky. Hercules manages to drink a small quantity of Hera's divine milk, and it's enough to save his life. With her mission of mercy completed, Athena happily returns the baby to his mortal mother. But Hera learns of the deception and tries to kill Hercules in his crib. Straight away, in hasty anger, Hera, queen of the gods, sent snakes eager to coil their quick jaws around the child. But Hercules lifted up his head and for the first time made trial of battle. With his two hands, he seized by their necks the two serpents, and his grip squeezed the life out of the monsters, strangling them. Pindar, the Nemean Odes. Furious, Hera realizes she has little hope of killing the powerful young Hercules. Yet her thirst for revenge is great. She resolves to follow his footsteps on earth and do all in her power to torment him for the rest of his life. For the young Hercules, the countryside around Thebes provides an ideal setting for childhood. As he grows, his mortal stepfather sees to it that the boy receives the finest education possible. 
Hercules did very well at all the physical things. He was very good at wrestling, very good at archery, very good at chariot racing. The one thing he wasn't very good at uh, was playing the lyre, a stringed musical instrument, which was normally considered to be one of the things a gentleman should be able to do. And we're told that his lyre teacher, a man named Lycus, would get very angry with him, was always complaining and telling Hercules what a fool he was and how fat his fingers were and things like this. It is during a lyre lesson in his teenage years that the young Hercules first shows a darkly violent side of his personality. Enraged at his teacher's criticisms, his temper suddenly snaps. Hercules lashes out with his lyre, cracking his teacher's skull, killing him instantly. Though regretful of what he has done, this will not be the last time that Hercules' fiery disposition and superhuman strength will be turned against another. His mortal stepfather fears that Hercules may commit further acts of violence. So he sends him away to an isolated farm. It is here that Hercules grows into manhood. At the age of 18, Hercules is already stronger and more courageous than anyone in Thebes. His restless spirit craves adventure. When he learns that a neighboring kingdom is in danger from a marauding lion, he decides to go to its aid. He hears about a lion that's ravaging the territory of Thespiae, ruled by King Thespius. And Hercules decides to go and kill the lion. And he fights this lion and kills it with his bare hands. And Thespius is very, very impressed. The king admires Hercules' strength and courage. He has 50 daughters and wants each of them to have a child by this powerful hero. Expecting him to accomplish this in one night, the king prepares a banquet in his honor and sees to it that Hercules is served all the wine he can drink. The task is made easier by the fact that Hercules has an enormous appetite for both wine and women, traits that will come back to haunt him throughout his life. Hercules gets drunk and Thespius sends all 50 daughters to Hercules on the same night and he has sex 50 times in one night, producing 50 sons. The town of Thespiae gets completely repopulated by Hercules. While returning to his home in Thebes, Hercules comes upon a party of envoys. They are on a tax collecting mission imposed on Thebes by the neighboring king of the Minions. It's an encounter that will trigger a war. When the envoys demand that Hercules give them the right of way, his temper once again explodes. Ignoring the sacred law of diplomatic immunity that protects foreign envoys, Hercules lops off their ears and noses and sends them back to their master. He then rouses Thebes to fight against these oppressors. The Thebans don't have any weapons because they were disarmed by the minions. So Hercules does another thing that's not normally acceptable behavior. He goes into a temple and takes out all these weapons that have been given to the gods, and you're not normally allowed to do that. And he rearms the Thebans, and they fight a big battle with the minions and defeat them. And Hercules then makes it so that the minions now have to give tribute to the Thebans every year. In gratitude for their victory over the minions, the king of Thebes gives Hercules his beautiful daughter in marriage. The couple fall deeply in love, and over the next few years, they have three sons. Hercules' devotion to his family seems to quell the darker side of his personality, and he continues to perform heroic deeds. He even saves Thebes from an invading tyrant who tries to seize the throne. Such exploits make him the most famous and admired man in Greece. 
Just as Hercules appears to be fulfilling his destiny, a destiny planned for him long ago by his father Zeus, Zeus's jealous wife Hera intervenes. The queen of the gods strikes Hercules with a violent fit of madness. Not the groaning sea's violence, not earthquakes, nor the gasping agonies of thunderbolts shall match my wrath as I strike Hercules to the heart. Send maniac fury on this man, distort his mind with lust for the blood of his own wife and children, rack him with lunatic convulsions, that when he, with guilt-red hand, has sent his family over the river of death, he may perceive how hot is Hera's anger against him. Euripides, the madness of Hercules. When Hercules recovers his senses, he realizes that he has inadvertently murdered his own family. What shame, what misery, to become the murderer of my most dear wife and sons. Why do I not take my life, leap from some bare cliff, aim a sword at my own heart, become myself the avenger of my family's blood, or burn my flesh with fire to avert the infamy which now awaits me? Euripides, the madness of Hercules. Wanting desperately to atone for his crime, Hercules travels to the city of Delphi, where he consults the renowned oracle, the high priestess at the temple of Apollo. The story was that there was a crack in the ground, and out of this crack in the ground came all kinds of smoke from down in a deep subterranean chamber. And a woman would sit on a bronze tripod, a kind of three-legged stool, over the crack in the ground, and she would like babble and wail incoherently. And if you wanted to know something, you came to Delphi and asked the oracle your question. And the oracle would then make all this noise. And somebody employed by the oracle would then decode this for you and tell you what the oracle had said. Hercules is told that the only way to repent for what he has done is to subject himself to terrible dangers and humiliation. He must serve the cowardly King Eurystheus of Tyrans for 12 years, performing any 12 labors that the king might impose. People did not normally receive capital punishment for murder in Greek antiquity, at least in mythical and legendary antiquity. They went to the Delphic Oracle or to another authority accepted by everyone and they received a term and instead of 20 years in the slammer they might be given a list of community service tasks and that is really what Hercules did. Only by performing 12 labors will Hercules be cleansed of his guilt and be rewarded with immortality. Resigned to his fate Hercules sets off for Tyrans to serve a cowardly king and confront his destiny. When Hercules arrives in Tyrans to fulfill his destiny, he is in his mid-twenties. He hopes to make up for the murder of his family by performing 12 labors for King Eurystheus. But serving his new master will be nearly as challenging as the labors themselves. Ironically, both men were born on the same day. And the king is jealous of the fame and glory that has been won by the mighty Hercules. They are metaphorically siblings. It is Eurystheus who was born first on the fateful day of Hercules' birth. And we have that great folk motif of the older but slightly stupider brother 
telling the younger brother what to do, the younger brother having to do it even though he doesn't want to and resenting it. With eager malice, the cowardly king devises labors that will humiliate and ultimately destroy the great hero. The first of Hercules' 12 tasks is to kill and skin a powerful lion that is terrorizing a neighboring kingdom. The lion's pelt is impervious to any known weapon. So Hercules carves a huge club from an olive tree and tries to beat the creature to death. When this fails, he single-handedly grapples with a beast and strangles it. Then using one of the lion's own razor-like claws, Hercules skins the animal. From this time on, he will wear the pelt as a protective suit of armor, assuring him of immunity in future battle. It's always very interesting to have this hero who's donned an animal skin, who carries around this great big club, battling monsters that, that often resemble him in some way or another. That I find particularly interesting about the myth, that this hero can be so beast-like himself, yet be a civilizing force for the Greeks. Dismayed at Hercules' triumph, King Eurystheus immediately dispatches Hercules on his next labor. He's sent to battle a terrifying monster, the Hydra. This fearsome, multi-headed creature is killing travelers and poisoning the land with its potent venom. Ordinary weapons are of no use against it, for every time Hercules strikes off one of the heads, two more grow in its place. In a grueling struggle, Hercules manages to sear the Hydra's decapitated neck stumps with a flaming torch before the new heads can grow. He then splits the monster's carcass open and dips his arrows in its deadly poisonous insides. Now the merest scratch from one of the arrows will be lethal. As Hercules performs labor after labor, King Eurystheus becomes increasingly frustrated. Far from destroying Hercules and his reputation, every task the king sets for him only increases Hercules' fame. Eurystheus in most of the stories is represented as a kind of shallow figure uh, who lives ultimately in mortal terror of the kinds of beasts uh, that Hercules brings back when instructed to do so. One of the favorite themes of ancient art when treating Eurystheus was to show him hiding in a pot. Being at the constant beck and call of a king given to cowering in a pot strains Hercules' thinning patience. Hercules was very angry about having to serve King Eurystheus but he knew he had to do it. So Hercules' anger seems to build up and up and up during this whole long period when he's performing these labors. Aware that his temper was the original cause of his troubles, Hercules manages to restrain his frustrations and keep silent. When you do get Hercules talking about how he feels about his labors, it's not in relationship to Eurystheus as much as it's in relationship to his family and that he's neglected the important things in his life. Driven ever onward by the deep feeling of remorse for his dead family, Hercules continues to accomplish every arduous task Eurystheus sets for him. He even finds time to complete many other heroic deeds, such as sailing with Jason and the Argonauts in search of the fabled Golden Fleece. Though renowned for his physical strength, 
Hercules sometimes displays other sides of his character. In one of his most celebrated labors, he cleans the gigantic stables of a king named Augeus by changing the course of a nearby river. King Eurystheus continues his vendetta against Hercules, sending him on ever more difficult missions throughout Greece. Hercules starts off with a group of six labors that are all in the area around Mycenae and Tiryns and Thebes in the central part of Greece. But then he gets sent on a series of other labors which in a way kind of define the boundaries of the world where mortals live. During his last six labors, Hercules roams to the very ends of the earth to capture a sacred bull to tame the man-eating horses of an evil king, to defeat the Amazons and take their queen's magnificent golden girdle, to vanquish a gruesome, free-bodied monster. On one adventure, Hercules even stands in for the great Atlas and holds up the sky. The labors kind of define the boundaries of the mortal world. And they also seem to define the boundaries of humanity in a more metaphysical kind of way, in that a lot of Hercules' adventures are connected in various ways with death and the conquest of death. And the most obvious one uh, connected with the conquest of death is the last of his labors. For Hercules' twelfth and final task, King Eurystheus chooses a mission that he believes no mortal on earth could ever accomplish to descend to the land of the dead, the realm of Hades, god of the underworld. From there, he is to return with Hades' ferocious watchdog, Cerberus, the terrifying three-headed hound of hell. Though nearing exhaustion from his years of servitude, Hercules is undaunted. Guided by Athena into the dark underworld, he wins Hades' permission to borrow Cerberus, but only if he can master the beast without using weapons. With his bare hands, Hercules chokes the hellhound into submission and drags him up to the land of the living. When confronted with the hellish creature, King Eurystheus can't believe his eyes. Hercules has indeed achieved the impossible. Terrified, the king flees to his pot, releasing Hercules from his 12 long years of bondage. With his labors completed, Hercules is filled with joy. He has finally been liberated from the guilt of his family's murder and his heroic deeds have helped to tame vast regions of the world. Hercules is the great Greek civilizing hero who opens up the world for the spread of Greek culture. Hercules, son of Zeus, has surpassed the glory of his birth with the labors of his noble life. By destroying beasts of which men have lived in terror, he won for us the tranquility we enjoy. Euripides, The Madness of Hercules. Now, the mightiest hero in all of history looks forward to building a new life, one that he ultimately hopes to share with a new wife and a new family. Having finally completed his labors of redemption, mighty Hercules is now able to look for another wife. A king in southern Greece has offered the hand of his beautiful daughter in marriage to anyone who can beat him in an archery contest. Though almost 40 years of age, Hercules easily wins the competition, but the king declares the result invalid, accusing Hercules of using magic arrows. 
bitter at the insult. Hercules nevertheless manages to control his rage. Having found inner peace by accomplishing his 12 arduous tasks, he sets his sights on another beautiful princess named Dianyra. To win her hand, he must defeat Dianyra's other suitor in a wrestling match. This opponent is the local river god, part serpent, part man, with the horn of a bull. His enormous strength will test Hercules to the limit. Warm and more warm, the conflict grows. Dire was the noise of rattling bows. Deep was the animated strife for love, for conquest, and for life, Sophocles. After a ferocious battle, Hercules overpowers the river god, and Dianyra becomes his bride. The newlyweds now begin the journey back to Hercules' home. Along the way, they encounter a wide river that will be difficult for Dianyra to cross. But a passing centaur named Nessus offers to help. The centaur carries Dianyra safely across the river, but once they reach the other side, he tries to rape her. Hearing Dianyra's screams, Hercules fires one of his poisoned arrows at the centaur. Yet even in his dying agony, the wily creature thinks of a way to take revenge on Hercules. He convinces Dianyra that she should collect a vial of his blood. If she ever feels that Hercules' desire for her is waning, she should use it as a potion to restore his love. But unbeknown to the innocent Dianyra, the blood is now mixed with the Hydra's poison from Hercules' arrow and is itself deadly. Hercules and Dianyra arrive at their home anticipating a bright future together. But Hera, Hercules' old archenemy, has other plans. While the couple entertain guests at a grand banquet, Hera seizes her chance. With Hercules drunk on wine and merrymaking, she puts the thought in his mind that one of his guests has accused Hercules of stealing. Suddenly, his temper, which he seems to finally have under control, erupts violently. Hercules hurls his visitor from the roof of his house to his death. The murder of a guest, the maltreatment of a guest, uh, is among one of the most potent evils with which Greek mythology deals. In a time of wandering and peril, the safety of the stranger has to be guaranteed. And Greek mythology, the heroic tales in particular, spend a great deal of time talking about the vengeance which is visited upon those who fail to realize and to recognize those obligations. Now, with another murder on his conscience, Hercules makes a second trip to the temple of Apollo in Delphi to be purified. But this time, the oracle refuses to help. The oracle is so appalled at what he's done that she refuses to answer him at all. Hercules gets very angry, as usual, and he goes to the oracle and grabs the old woman and pulls her off the tripod and takes the tripod and says, if you won't tell me what to do, I'll set up my own oracle and decide for myself what to do. The god Apollo, whose shrine this is, where the oracle takes place, Apollo becomes very angry, and he comes down to Earth to intercept Hercules. Now, there was a struggle that resulted from that, where Hercules and Apollo fought for the tripod on which the, the priestess sat. Zeus intervened, sent down a thunderbolt, and he restored the tripod to Apollo. 
Zeus convinces Apollo that Hercules should be forgiven for his crime. Apollo says he will forgive Hercules on condition that Hercules agrees to be sold into slavery for three years. And so Hercules says, okay, I'll do this. And what happens is that the gods rig the sail so that he's bought by a woman, the queen of Lydia, a woman named Omphali. And this was felt to be especially humiliating to be sold as a slave to a woman. Omphali buys Hercules because she likes the look of him and thinks he's going to be a great sex toy for the next three years. For those three years, Omphali forces Hercules, mightiest of men and symbol of masculine strength, to wear women's clothes. One can only speculate on the exact nature of the relationship between a powerful queen and the strong man she forces to dress as a woman. They do all kinds of things which were just totally unacceptable in Greek culture. They both get very involved in transvestite behavior. Hercules bears these indignities stoically, but deep within, he is in a rage. After his three years of humiliating servitude are up, his anger is ready to burst forth in a massive wave. He sets out for Greece, bent on revenge against all who have wronged him in the past. Hercules finally arrives home after his enslavement to Queen Omphale. Now he seeks revenge on King Augeas, the man who had refused to reward him for cleaning his stables during his 12 great labors. Raising an army, Hercules attacks, destroying Augeas and his entire kingdom. To celebrate his victory, Hercules inaugurates the greatest of all Greek festivals, the Olympic Games. He decrees that the games be held every four years in honor of his father, the god Zeus. The story of Hercules' founding of the Olympic Games is rather inescapable. It is only natural to claim that your heroes were great athletes. Uh, and since Hercules is the most heroic of them all, it would be almost unthinkable not to have him the founder of the Olympic Games. Hercules now sets his sights on the king who had refused him his daughter after Hercules' victory in the archery contest. After a bitter battle, Hercules kills the king and takes his daughter captive, the still beautiful Princess Aeoli. His burning passion for Aeoli is quickly rekindled. He takes the princess back to his home, where his wife, Dianyra, is waiting patiently for his return. When she sees Hercules' prisoner, Dianyra is convinced that she has lost her husband's love. But when Hercules asks for a cloak so that he can offer a thanksgiving sacrifice to Zeus, Dianyra thinks she sees a way to restore her husband's affections. She remembers the love potion that the centaur Nessus had given her, the same potion that, unknowingly to Dianyra, has been made deadly by the Hydra's poison. Soaking the cloak in the potion, Dianyra presents it to Hercules. Hercules puts on the cloak and is suddenly his whole body is consumed in agonizing pain. It feels like he's being burned alive and he starts to die. He's rolling around in the dirt and dying. Dianyra realizes that Nessus has made a fool out of her and she hangs herself out of remorse. Hercules, though, gradually is being eaten away by all this pain. Oh Zeus, where in the world have I come? Among what mortals do I lie? racked by unceasing pains. 
Many and savage have been the labors of my arms and my back, and yet never has the wife of Zeus or hateful Eurystheus set such a thing upon me as this. Sophocles. In unendurable torment, Hercules senses that his death is near. He is carried to a nearby mountain where a huge funeral pyre is erected. Twisting in agony as he lies on the pyre, Hercules asks for someone to set it ablaze and end his suffering. But just before the torch is kindled, Princess Ioli arrives at his side. The sight of his latest love brings out Hercules' most poignant feelings. Ioli, brightest of maidens, thy voice shall cheer me as I sink down in the sleep of death. Weep not, for my toil is done and now is the time for rest. I shall see thee again in the bright land which is never trodden by the feet of night. Sir George Cox, Tales of the Gods and Heroes. The fire is lit, and as the flames spread, the body of the mighty Hercules is reduced to ashes. Suddenly, a great bolt of lightning flashes from the sky. Amid peals of thunder, Zeus transports his son's immortal essence to sacred Mount Olympus, home of the gods. There, Hercules is finally reconciled with Hera, who adopts him and swears love for him as if he were her own son. Thus, Hercules' destiny is fulfilled. Despite his human mistakes, his heroic deeds have won him immortality. The legend of Hercules has survived for thousands of years, providing a never-ending source of rousing and inspiring tales. I'm enthralled by the stories of Hercules for the same reason everyone else is. They're great stories. That's not the scholarly response. I'm supposed to say that I'm interested in the historical aspects of them. I'm interested in the way that uh, ancient writers uh, have chosen to treat this particular figure, and I am, of course. But essentially, I'm interested in them because they're wonderful stories. But buried within the legend, there lies a deeper meaning to the myths of the mighty Hercules. I think that one of the big issues that we see in the mythical biography of Hercules is this concern with what it means to be human and civilized and sort of the uncontrollable savage forces in the world. And I think that that's an enduring problem that we deal with today still, that we are these civilized human beings walking around, but yet humans can do all kinds of sort of crazy, almost animalistic things. He could serve as an example of someone who could go astray and still do good, still do good things for the community. But also, Hercules simply reminded them of how close we all walk to the edge of what is acceptable. Though larger than life, Perhaps in the end, what Hercules leaves behind is his humanity, his struggle to better himself, his failures as well as his triumphs, and a story that resonates down to us from the ancient Greeks, that physical strength is nothing without strength of character, and that even heroes can lose their way. Of all the Greek heroes, Hercules was the only one to be raised to the status of a god and worshipped throughout the ancient world. But despite this presumed divinity and his enormous strength, he was essentially a rather human figure. Maybe because we can see a little bit of ourselves in this epic character, his story endures. <laughs>